So last week I did a pretty well received video in which I attempted to begin the process of summarizing every single leader of every country in the world in alphabetical order. Last time we got through all of the A's, so let us begin now with the B's. Country number 12, the Bahamas. The Prime Minister of the Bahamas is Dr. Hubert Minnis. He came to power almost exactly one year ago in May of 2017. His Conservative Party won a massive landslide victory, winning 90% of Parliament's seats in what was seen as a crush rebuke of the previous five years of left-wing rule. Unlike most world leaders who insist upon being called doctor, Dr. Minnis is an actual medical doctor. He is the former head of the Bahamas Medical Association and served as health minister in a previous conservative administration. Dr. Minnis has never really been considered a particularly strong leader, even within his own party, which is perhaps why he leans so heavily into the doctor gimmick. I have said before, it's time for a doctor. This ad is being sponsored by Campaign Minutes 2016. Country number 13 is Bahrain. The head of this tiny Middle Eastern monarchy is King... Uh, King Sheikh Hamed ibn Asa al Khalifa. In power since the death of his father in 1999, he is 68 years old and has been a big player in Bahrain politics for quite a while now, mostly as the longtime head of the country's armed forces during his father's administration. King Hamed is a fairly typical Middle Eastern monarch in the sense that he seems to combine a life of decadent luxury with soft core Islamic fundamentalism. And of course, like most of these sort of guys, he is supposedly one of our great allies in the Middle East. He is a backer of the general US-Israel-Saudi alliance against Iran, and is always trying to suck up to the West by making such a big deal about what a reformer he is and how tolerant his government is of minorities. But of course the king would say that because he himself is a minority in his own country. Bahrain is a majority Shiite country, but the royal family are all Sunnis. This power imbalance has caused a lot of political tension in that country in recent years, as well as a lot of embarrassment for the queen when she invites him to the races. Number 14, Bangladesh. The Prime Minister of Bangladesh is Sheikh Hazina, one of the two so-called dueling divas who have dominated Bangladeshi politics for the last three decades. They are these two women who are the heirs of these very powerful Bangladeshi political families, and they run the two main political parties, and they really, 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 really hate each other. Sheikh Hazina is the daughter of the country's first president. In 1975, he was overthrown and his entire family was murdered, except for Hazina, who was a student in Germany at the time. She became his political heir and assumed control of his political party, which she has been running for over 30 years now. Hazina was first elected prime minister in 1996, and then she was voted out of power in 2001, then she was voted back in power in 2008, and then re-elected in 20. There's supposed to be another election in Bangladesh pretty soon, but the opposition party is threatening to boycott because their leader is currently in prison on what they say are trumped up political charges invented by the Prime Minister. And who is this other leader? Well, her name is Khalida Zia. She is the widow of the seventh president of Bangladesh, who was also overthrown and murdered in a brutal coup that made her his heir. Since the 1990s, she has been Prime Minister in any year where the other woman wasn't. People in Bangladesh often say that like the only animating purpose of both of these women's lives is to achieve total dominance over the other one. And for now, it seems like Hazina's winning. Okay, country number 15 is Barbados. The head of Barbados is Prime Minister oh. Mia Motley. She was elected on Thursday. Motley has been involved in Barbados politics for basically all of her adult life. She first joined the Barbados Senate when she was only 26 and became a cabinet minister when she was in her 20s as well. As a longtime leading light in the Barbados Labour Party, she has been a persistent critic of the policies of the Barbados Democratic Labour Party, which I guess is different in some way. Her very recent successful campaign for the prime ministership got a noticeable boost after she was endorsed by Rihanna who is apparently from Barbados. Did you know that? Hello everyone, this is JJ. I'm sorry to interrupt this video, but I have to make a confession. I actually filmed this video on Thursday, on the evening of the Barbados general election. And though it did seem quite obvious to me that Miss Motley was going to win, I underestimated by just how wide of a margin she would win and how big of a story that would wind up being. So, Miss Motley not only won the Barbados election, she won it unanimously, which is to say that she won every single seat in the Barbados parliament, 
which is really an accomplishment that is quite unprecedented in the world of uh, democracy. So that is now probably one of the most defining features of her entire administration and her entire political career. Number 16, Belarus. The current president of Belarus is Alexander Lukashenko. He is also the only ever president of Belarus. Lukashenko was elected in 1994, shortly after Belarus separated from the Soviet Union. At that time, Lukashenko was a fairly obscure, not particularly well-known politician, but he was running against the incumbent communist leader and the people wanted a change. But alas, shortly after victory, Lukashenko proceeded to make himself dictator for life and now the people of Belarus are stuck living under what is often described as one of the most weird and backwards governments in the world. It is a society in which a Soviet bureaucrat from the 1970s is still trying to bring to life his vision of the 1990s. Number 17, Belgium. The premier of Belgium is Charles Michel. He has been in power since 2014. Michel is quite young, only 38 years old, and has been involved in Belgian politics for basically his whole life. He won his first elected office at age 18 and was appointed to cabinet when he was only 24. No doubt part of the reason why he was so politically successful was because his father, Louis Michel, was a big important Belgian politician too. As you can tell by his name and his voice. And I confirm we have a very good bilateral relationships. He is part of Belgium's French-speaking minority, who do not often get to be prime minister much these days. Prime ministers of Belgium are not really elected because the Belgian parliament is almost always a horrible mess of so many small little parties. It's not like England or Canada or wherever where one party very clearly wins. Michel's party only won 9% of the vote in the last election, but he was able to become PM by forming an alliance with three other Dutch parties. The media said it was a coalition that would never last and possibly destroy the country, but I mean, they always say that about Belgium. Number 18 is Belize. So Belize is a small country in Latin America that is easy to forget. Their prime minister is Dean Barrow. He is Belize's first black prime minister and also its longest serving, having been first elected in 2008 and then re-elected in 2012 and then re-elected in 2015. But the most famous and interesting thing about prime minister Darrow is his son, who is the rapper Shine. Shine was briefly a hot young rapper on the rise who was a big pal of P. Diddy who was very convinced he was going to be the next big thing. But then Shine got caught up in this nightclub shooting and was sent to prison for 10 years and then deported back to Belize. He has since converted to Orthodox Judaism and says that in the next election he is going to run for parliament and then take over for his father when his father steps down. I was not able to find any evidence that Prime Minister Darrow supports this plan. Number 19, Benin. The president of Benin is Patrice Talon. He was elected in 2016 in a big dramatic democratic upset of the sort that Africa does not often have, unseating the ruling party candidate. Talon is one of the richest men in Benin, having made millions as a corporate titan in the cotton industry, which is Benin's primary export. His wealth gave him a lot of political independence, which is how he was able to mount a successful independent candidacy for president. In his own way, he is a sort of Trump-like guy who likes flouting how rich and successful he is. Like most presidents of his sort, Talon's administration is really determined to push through a bunch of economic and political reforms that only he, as a successful businessman, knows the country really needs. He has also rather cockily promised to get it all done in only one term and never seek another. Number 20 is Bhutan. Bhutan's leader is King Wang Chuk, who assumed the throne in 2006 when he was 26 years old after his father abdicated at the ripe old age of 51. Bhutan is actually a country in a sort of state of political transition, and it is not super clear who should really be counted as their ruler. In 2008, they had their first elections, and in 2013, they elected their first ever opposition prime minister, which was obviously a big deal. But under their constitution, their king still has a lot of political power and is still a very active and engaged member of their government. He has not yet downgraded to full figurehead status, even though that seems like the eventual goal. So I don't know, 
maybe he's like best compared to like Queen Victoria or something. Number 21, Bolivia. The president of Bolivia is Evo Morales, who is one of these guys that I feel you used to hear a lot about, but you don't hear much about these days. First elected in 2006, he made a lot of headlines around the world for being his country's first ever indigenous president, as well as for being very left-wing. People worried he might be the next Hugo Chavez, but it seems like he is more left-wing in like the identity politics direction as opposed to like the communist direction. His biggest thing has been this project to redefine Bolivia's national identity as a country of indigenous peoples rather than a country of white Spanish colonial settlers, which makes sense since the majority of Bolivians are in fact indigenous peoples. So President Morales has, for instance, changed the Bolivian constitution to give a lot of powers of self-government to local indigenous tribes. He has also rather controversially encouraged the cultivation of coca, which is a traditional indigenous crop often used to make cocaine. And you know, he's done a lot of symbolic stuff as well, like giving the country a new indigenous inspired flag and elevating indigenous languages to the same official status as Spanish. But he has also hung around for a very long time and seems to be getting increasingly dictatorial. He will be seeking a fourth term later this year, which is seen as really testing the limits of his own popularity. And lastly, country 22, Bosnia and Herzegovina. So as you probably know, during the 1990s, Bosnia and Herzegovina was the site of a horrible civil war with lots of violence between the Bosnians, Serbs, and Croats. And that war was ended in 1995 with the Dayton Peace Accords, which imposed this new, very complicated political system on the country. It is a system in which authority is so widely dispersed among so many different characters that it is very difficult to say who's really in charge. So there is a collective presidency of three people, each of whom represents one of the ethnic groups. Uh, their names are, oh boy, this should be fun. Um, Maladin Ivanik, Dragon Kovic, and Bakir Izbetsegovic. It's it is and then there's a guy that's sort of like a prime minister called the chairman of the council of ministers who is the head of the parliament. Right now that is Denis Zvidic who leads a complicated multi-ethnic coalition government, which is the only sort of government that is allowed. And then there's this other guy with the grand title of High Representative of the International Community. He is appointed by the UN and can veto things to make sure there's not another civil war. Right now that job is held by an Austrian guy named Valentine Inzko. All of these people have different powers that overlap and contradict in various ways. I don't know, the whole thing seems like some really condescending bureaucratic hell. So I guess the lesson is don't start a civil war. Anyway, that is 11 more world leaders for you. And we're not even done the bees yet. This might actually take a lot longer than I thought. Anyway, one other piece of news this week. By next Saturday, I will have hopefully passed a very important milestone for this channel, 50,000 subscribers. In honor of that, I want to do another Q&A video in which you guys can ask me questions about anything. It can be a question about me personally, or something about Canada, or something about politics, or anything else you want. Just post your questions below, or in the community tab, and I look forward to answering a bunch of them next week.